All right. Well, good morning again. Um, this morning is one of those messages where I wish I had another week to process. Um, because even overnight and this morning, I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. Or, oh, I need to put that in there. Or I need to say this. And you'll kind of see as we, as we go along what I mean by that. But uh, I think about that too as far as, you know, whether it's our, our salvation or scripture. All these things are, are complete. And yet, as we process them throughout our weeks, um, you know, we, we find that we ourselves... Uh, have some some room to go to be complete as well. And so this is one of those topics today as we talk about uh, stewardship, we talk, talk about ownership. Uh, there's a lot more to it and a lot more depth uh, to it. Um, so that's, that's the invitation as we enter into this week is, you know, taking time to process um, what we're going to be talking about today and uh, to make it your own as, as you work it out in the, the coming week. Uh, just like I will continue to do as well. So part of it comes down to, to perspective. And um, I talked about that a little bit as we started the service today. But does everyone know, there's, I have the words to a, a song up here. Uh, listen to this on Friday. It says, when all I see is the battle, you see my victory. Everybody familiar with that song? When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain moved. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, you see the empty tomb. And so we have these different perspectives. We see things in a certain way, and God sees them sometimes in a different way. So perspective, being able to shift our perspective to be more in line with his I think results in some very powerful and life-changing dynamics in our life and the influences that we have on those that are around us, those that we're in relationship with. And so there's a lot of different ways to begin cultivating this shift in perspective with the first step of just being open to it. Um, sometimes we like how we have things set up in life, right? Or um, just so. And so when we welcome God into our lives, when we welcome him to, to come in and change things, sometimes it gets messy. Sometimes uh, things get shaken up more than, than we like to have sometimes. So the first step is just being open to it. I'm not sure what step in the process this is, but even as we read scripture, it's important to look at it from maybe two different perspectives. We look at not only the teachings of Jesus, but also we look at the teacher himself. Because sometimes we get focused on the words and maybe we forget the one who is speaking them. And we not only look at scripture, but we also look at the power of God that extends into our lives every day, to this day. So to be aware of our surroundings, to see the situations that we're in, to understand what the scripture says, and also to be aware of the Holy Spirit, where he is moving, the power of God in the present moment, and his power in all things. So the text today is a great example of not only looking at what the passage means, but also what it means for us today as we head into the week ahead. One of the things that pops into my mind on more than one occasion is uh, the saying, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. Does anybody run into that at all? Yes? Okay, good. Whew. Glad I'm not the only one. That's been the story of my week as I continue to process ownership versus stewardship that we're going to be talking about today. Sometimes the more that we study scripture, the more answers we receive, but it can also lead to more questions than when we started off or more self-analysis self than maybe what we were expecting or even wanting. So today we're going to look at three different teachings of Jesus in Mark 12, but there's a common thread through it all. As I was vacuuming up here on Friday, I was thinking about authority. Don talked about authority last week. 
and the authority that we're called to stand in, to stand for justice, for what's right, for what scripture says versus culture, authority and deliverance and healing and the supernatural. And in the dialogue that I was having, the conversation turned though, and it wasn't so much as about my legs, so to speak, and the standing in authority, it shifted to where are my arms and my hands in the equation. So I think it's one thing to stand, but are my arms in a posture of being open, submitting, maybe letting go, lifting up, receiving, maybe a posture of humility, maybe my hands are raised, giving praise, recognizing where my authority comes from. So yes, it's one thing to stand in authority, but recognizing where that authority comes from is critical in exercising the authority that God has given us. So my question is, can it be just like your mouth that your arms and your posture, your hands can reveal the attitude of the heart? I think there's a big difference between crossed arms versus open for a hug or pointing a finger versus coming in for a handshake. Those are stark contrasts to each other. So there's a stark contrast in our posture when we stand in authority, when we recognize where authority comes from versus calling it our own. So it's something to think about as we interact with others throughout our week. Where are our hands and our arms? And is there a connection of this to where your heart or your mind are at in the moment. So perform a little psychological experiment on yourself this week. So let's take a look at the scripture for this morning. So we're going to uh, open our Bibles if you want to, or we'll have it up on the screen. We're going to look at the first 12 verses in Mark chapter 12. I'm going to read it off the screen because it is a little more challenging with a microphone. All right. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went away. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat, and others they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is amazing in our eyes. When they realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd. So they left him and went away. So this story about the vineyard is, is taken from uh, Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. And so if you want to read that, uh, it's basically talking about the vineyard, um, God as the owner of the vineyard, and the vineyard is Israel. The tenants are the religious leaders. The servants are the prophets and the priests who remain faithful. And the son is Jesus. In Isaiah, there's some additional um, scenery, uh, the hedge or the fence being the law, the tower equals a temple, and the pit or the wine press equals the altar. 
So Jesus is tying back into Isaiah. In Isaiah, the problem lies in the fruitless vineyard. But in Mark, the problem is the vine dressers or the tenants. So in verse 7, it talks about how the tenants thought they would just take over the inheritance, which is pretty ridiculous because no court would award ownership this way. The same thing goes with the kingdom. As Jesus tells this parable, he's exposing the religious leader's plot to kill him. And he has a warning that their sins would indeed be punished. They can't kill the son and hope to receive the inheritance by default. We see authority and greed and power are all things that these tenants are in desire of and think that it is attainable by their own actions and even a step further actions that are against moral and ethical and religious law. So it's a very clear picture of the religious leaders self-serving abuse of the authority entrusted to them by reaching for ownership rather than exercising stewardship. They say the inheritance will be ours. But it's interesting to note that God is not rejecting the vineyard. He's only rejecting its leaders. And by them rejecting the son, even more so killing the son, they have ensured their own rejection as well. And so Isaiah isn't the only reference that Jesus supplies here in this discourse. Verses 10 through 11 refers back to Psalm 118, 22 and 23. That he is the cornerstone that is used to make sure all of the other stones of the building are straight and narrow. Where once stood the law, now stands Jesus. So what do these first 12 verses mean for me or for us? I don't own a vineyard. I don't work on a vineyard. I'm not looking to beat other people up. I try to remain faithful. I'm accepting of the son. So how does this pertain to me? Well, the great thing about parables is it sends us on a quest of discovery. So what are the things that we have been given by God to be caretakers of? Resources, right? Time and money. A spouse, maybe. Kids. Authority. This facility. If we sit, this, sit with this for a while... We can really break down all of the things that God has given to us or entrusted to us. Are they ours? Do we own these things? Now we could probably discuss some ins and outs of this, but for the purpose this morning, we'll say, no, we don't own these things. They have been given to us by God. And they have been given to us by God to steward. Just like in the story we just read, the tenants took an approach of reaching for ownership rather than exercising stewardship, where they say the inheritance will be ours. And we see this throughout the Old Testament as we go all the way back even to the Garden of Eden. There was a reach in the garden for ownership instead of stewardship of that which was already given. So are we seeking our inheritance? Are we seeking to be God of our own lives? Are we seeking ownership rather than recognizing that which we have been given is not to own, but to steward? Talk about a shift in perspective. We probably don't walk around thinking about ownership versus stewardship necessarily when it, when it comes to some of the above things. But what happens when we do see things as gifts that God has called us to steward because they are. So now you're starting to see where I am at in the midst of processing this because I think we can go pretty deep with this mindset. What does it look like to steward our time? 
What does it look like to steward our money? Does it change a relationship with a spouse? How about a child? What about your calling in life and what you put your hands to as a profession? What about authority? Authority is a gift to be stewarded. What happens when we cross the line in any of these areas and say, the inheritance will be mine and reach for ownership instead of stewardship? We're not going to break that down right now. But just think about the contrast between the two. This building is not ours. Now our names and our church name are on the bank paperwork and according to the state, yes, we own this building. But we don't. We don't own it. It's a gift. It's an awesome gift of space, refuge, house of worship. All of this is God's. And I love the common prayer in our church finance meetings. And Matt leads, a, leads the way on this with us. Is Lord, make us good stewards. Help us to steward that which you have given to us. Our facility, our finances, people. It's such an amazing posture to take. For me, it's been freeing to let go of that which... I have tried to own in the past and shift more towards the stewardship perspective. Time and money were two big things for me. I've tried to own these things over the years. And in reality, they end up owning me. Living in fear of, in pursuit of, trying to control the use of, trying to gain more of. But the pursuit becomes never ending because there's never enough. And while it's still a struggle from time to time, because as we look at our personal finances and our budgets, numbers don't lie, right? It's difficult sometimes. But it isn't until we look past the numbers and recognize that these things are a gift, that God is our provider, then our perspective shifts towards stewardship rather than ownership. So I spent many years giving God my last fruits of the month, Lord, whatever I have left over after I accomplish what I want to, whether it's time or money, then I'll give that to you. But God is the owner of the vineyard. God is the owner of our lives. We are called not to own, but to steward and to give him the first fruits of the day, the month, the year, our time, our money, our resources, even ourselves. On most days, I'll say that there's nothing left of me at the end of the day. Most days, not every day, but most days I leave it all on the field, so to speak. And I feel great on those days. I really accomplished some things. I got some stuff done. But unless I gave God the first fruits of my life and my day, Those things of the day quickly turn into just that, things. And I wear myself down, I wear myself out, and pretty soon I have less and less to give back to him. So give him our first fruits. Give to him that which is his to begin with. Don't hold so tightly to things that we view these things as our inheritance to hold on to, because our inheritance is the kingdom. If you have been given life, give life to others. If you have been given finances or a crop harvest or whatever it is, give back to God. If you have been given love, love your neighbor. If you have been given authority to heal, to cast out demons, to raise the dead, use that authority to do so. If you have been given a spouse or kids or family, lift them up to the Lord to be used for his purposes and not our own. And this list goes on and on, but the point I'm trying to make is don't seek that self-serving ownership of an inheritance that is less than 
and in the end, not ours. Seek to steward that which God has given us for a kingdom that is ours and more than we can obtain or grasp or hope for here on earth. So the religious leaders didn't like this parable of the vineyard because they knew that Jesus had spoken it against them. So they decided to send some Pharisees and Herodians to try and trap him. And so we pick up again in verse 13. Then they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. And so they brought one. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? And they answered, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. The Pharisees. The Pharisees are concerned about strict observance of written law. And they give validity to the oral law within Judaism. Not much is known about the the Herodians, but they are somehow connected to the civil government and Herod's court, hence the name. In my mind, I view them almost as an intermediary, so to speak, between kind of church and state, between Judaism and the Roman government. So in regards to taxes, you have the Herodians that desire it because they are getting kickbacks from this as long as there is no unrest in the land. And Jesus is stirring things up a little bit. And then we have the Pharisees who are going along with it, but they don't like it. And then you have the zealots who aren't mentioned here, but those are the ones that said no, and they refused to pay the taxes. So this question almost seems like a no-win situation for Jesus. He's either going to upset the crowd or he's going to get arrested for his answer. Is it pay or don't pay? But he takes it a different direction. Another interesting point here is that a denarius had the image of Tiberius on it. And it had an inscription on it that accorded him divine honors. So this posed some question around idolatry and the oral law which forbid uh, introducing any effigy of the emperor into the temple. So the fact that the Pharisees were able to so easily produce a denarius when Jesus asked to see one is again supporting evidence of their hypocrisy that Jesus calls them out on. The response of Jesus is amazing and it forces the questioners to answer for themselves. And he could have left it there, but Jesus continues and says, give back to God what belongs to God. So in true fashion, Jesus once more turns a trick question into an occasion to teach a basic principle for ethical decisions and a call to right living with God. All we have and are belongs ultimately to God because he made both it and us. So again, we see ownership versus stewardship. All that has been given has opportunity to be used for the glory of God if we take the right posture and give to God that which is his. which begins with who we are and our identity. So unlike the coin, we are image bearers of God. And thus we belong to God, so we give to him.
to him our lives. <clears throat> we choose to walk as sons and daughters of the Most High King, who is part of a kingdom that far surpasses that which we're a part of today. Earthly currency obviously ebbs and flows, recedes and inflates, can buy things yet doesn't hold value when compared to the eternal value of heaven and God's kingdom. So now, since the Pharisees and the Herodians couldn't catch Jesus, in a trap, we step into the next setting where the Sadducees decide to give it a try. And we're going to pick up in verse 18. <clears throat> Some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. So there were seven brothers, the first married, and when he died, left no children. And the second married the widow and died, leaving no children. And the third likewise, none of the seven left children. Last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Is not this the reason you are wrong, that you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? For when people rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the story about the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is God, not of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. So here we see the Sadducees, yet another group, looking to test and question Jesus. They only believed in the written law in the five books of Moses, which is Genesis through Deuteronomy. They did not view the prophets or the writings as scripture, and they rejected the authority of oral law. They also denied the doctrine of resurrection, which the Pharisees and others affirmed. So when they asked this question, it is in a very sarcastic and scoffing tone. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so when they, they asked this question, it's in a very sarcastic and scoffing tone because they don't even believe in resurrection. So they're kind of attacking the Pharisees through this question as well. And they're poking fun at them. And they say, let's see how Jesus answers this one. Ha, ha, ha. Right? The meaning of this passage, we can either read from the level of the Sadducees, right? And that's out of motivation and, and, and intention to trap. Or at the level of Jesus' answer. So we're going to look at Jesus' answer which is the correct thinking side of things. So Jesus' answer has more to do with God's self-revelation in Exodus 3.6. So it's interesting that Jesus uses this scripture because the Sadducees believed in Exodus. But they didn't see the, his response coming because the Pharisees had never argued from this position before. So where did this come from? But God is the God of the living, not of the dead. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, at the time where God met Moses in the bush, they, were, they had died at that point. Yet by the power and the word of God, they are alive. So all who belong to God, though they die, will live by the power of the word, I am your God. And then this testimony is linked 
to Mark 16, where the announcement at the tomb is, he has risen, he is not here. This stands over and against all human doubts and fears in the face of death. That our hope is not only in the teaching, but also in the teacher himself, Jesus. One of the commentaries I use, there's two paragraphs in there that I thought were really good, and so I want to go ahead and read those two. It says, to a church whose vision of the kingdom of God, and this isn't church, big church, right? To the church whose vision of the kingdom of God is limited to the kingdoms of this world and whose understanding of the power of God is determined solely by reality as we experience it. Jesus addresses a searching question, is, this, is not this why you are wrong? That you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So he calls us to a vision beyond our own. He opens the possibility of solutions quite other than we had dreamed. Or as I would insert the word, perspective. Perhaps acad academicians, academians, I don't know, academicians is a new word for me. Understand the scriptures, but not the power of God while enthusiasts understand the power of God, but not the scriptures. This text invites disciples to understand the scriptures and the power of God in the whole and vital way that Jesus did, so that the Bible will have its rightful place in the church as well as in individuals' lives. To reach this desirable goal, we must stop using the Bible to prove our points and promote our programs as the Sadducees did and attend instead to the living word of God. Whew, there's a lot in that. Do you ever get caught up in the what if questions with God? Right, as we read this section in Mark, I'm thinking to myself, what are the odds that a scenario like this would ever happen, right? A wife whose first husband dies and he goes, she goes through six more of the same brothers, right? What are the odds? But I think sometimes we come up with some scenarios as well that we have what if questions about. Sometimes it's in dialogue with God or maybe it's relationship with others. We get focused and hung up on something when in reality, God is saying that we need to shift our focus or our perspective over to him instead. Sometimes that means shifting our focus from attention on ourselves or maybe our, our own outcomes to attention on God. And I think we can get caught up on the stuff of life but it's better to put our focus on Jesus and who he says he is. Lord, show me how to steward my life. Make me a good steward of myself, who you have created and breathed life into. We aren't able to fathom or understand eternity and what heaven will be like until we get there. So instead, we focus on our relationship with Jesus in the here and now. Steph, if you want to go ahead and come on up. <clears throat> so the question for us as we enter this week, as we engage with people and our daily responsibilities, am I stewarding that which God has given me, including life itself? And maybe this will lead to more questions than answers, but that's okay. I think sometimes those places are the most impactful seasons of our life or of growth in our life, where these questions fuel our search for more of him in our everyday lives. And somehow it seems to turn in our everyday lives into 
maybe every hour or every minute lives as we become more aware of his presence throughout our day. Stewardship is about taking care of what we have been given, including our relationship with Jesus. It's about being a disciple, being open to and fostering that relationship, and being a follower not only of the teachings, but of the teacher himself. So if you want to go ahead and stand as we close in worship this morning.